Here we go. Jake and Josh are here to analyze the game they love for the team they love. This is another Dolphins Podcast. Here's your hosts, Jake Mendel and Josh Houts. Welcome to another edition of another Dolphins Podcast. It is Thursday. We are finally getting to the rhythm. We record with Merrick on Wednesdays, but this episode record premieres on Thursdays. So we are figuring it out here at another Dolphins Podcast, slowly but surely. Merrick Brave, Joshua Houts, gentlemen, the Dolphins are 2-0. and It's the middle of the week. How are we feeling? Feeling good. Like you said, Dolphins 2-0 and heading into their home opener. You know, two, two weeks on the road to open the season. They finally get to go home, get some home cooking against a, a, a struggling Denver Broncos team. You know, still a team with some good weapons and some good players. And, you know, we'll see what happens on Sunday. But it feels good to be a Dolphins fan right now. And it feels good to be on this podcast with you two gentlemen. Yeah, you couldn't have asked for a better start, right? I mean, our dreams are coming true right before our eyes. So 2-0 and start. We know this is a long season, so um, it'll take time, and we'll see how the rest of the year goes. But 2-0, and baby, great start, and happy to be able to come on here and talk Dolphins football. How are you doing, Jake? I love doing this so many times during the week because I, I get to ask the same questions, and I always get different answers. Merrick, it's the first time we're talking with you since the win. I mean, give, give me – I mean, you've had a couple of days to stew on it. What's, what's your first, maybe even second thought when you think about that win over the Patriots? Well, my first thought is that through two weeks, I've actually picked the Dolphins' uh, margin of victory correctly both times. I said they'd win by two points against the Chargers and seven points against the Patriots. I didn't get the scores right, but I got the the margin of victory correct in, in both instances. So that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, a lot of – I saw a lot of people online getting a little nervous about that Patriots game as it was progressing. I never felt nervous. Like as I was watching it, I just, I just felt like the dolphins kind of had it in the bag. I thought they looked like the better team on both sides of the ball. The offense was, was, was dominant again, outside of a couple miscues that cost them some points. I thought the defense was much improved, which was my major concern after week one against the chargers was, you know, Hey, this Vic, Vic Fangio defense was not as advertised week one, but week two was another story. I thought they looked good. They got turnovers, you know, no Jalen Phillips out there, but Andrew Van Ginkle played with his long flowing locks on fire. He was a, he was a stud against the Patriots. So I was never quite nervous during that Patriots game. And I wasn't too surprised that they, that the Dolphins came away with the victory. So happy that that happened. And it just feels like, uh, you know, things are going well for the Dolphins. So of course, Something's going to happen, right? Because that's what happens. We know that as as Dolphins fans for for however long now. When, when things are going well, uh, eventually that other shoe is going to drop and and it'll turn around. But hopefully not this year. Hopefully this is our year, and hopefully this is the year they kick the the curse. At Houts on Twitter, Joshua, we did our recap show earlier this week. You can go find it on our feed. But the the cut up god, as he's been claimed to be called. Posted some fun videos today, man. So now, you know, we, we spoke about the game. We, again, I'm going to use the word again, digested the game. But putting together those cut-ups, how are you feeling any different? Um, I mean, my biggest takeaway from all of this is that it's just not the same old Dolphins, right? I mean, Merrick sat there and said about how he was so just sitting there. He just felt confident in that New England game, no matter what the score was. So it just feels like a different, you know, um, feeling around this team and I think that's what gets you so excited you can see the way Mike McDaniel is using that motion I mean hell Alec Ingles lining all over the field in different spots you know confusing the defense um it's just a fun offense and I think you know many years ago when I think the Dolphins signed Adam Gase wasn't it that Stephen Ross was looking for the next young offensive minded head coach um you know they inadvertently fell into it right here with Mike McDaniel I mean he's perfect man offensive minded continues to churn it out and I just have to sit back and, you know, feel confident in this team, like Merrick said, because, you know, we got our quarterback. It feels like we have a head coach now. Hell, even Chris Greer, right? Marvin Allen, Reggie McKenzie, what they put together. Um, a running feels- game. And a running game, yes. I'm, I'll talk about the running game, though. I got to try to be a little bit harsh on it, but everything's coming together, and it just feels good heading into week three, 2-0, and oh, and um, – you know, you see some power rankings, man. The Dolphins are at the top. I mean, I'm ready. I'm not trying to get that far ahead of it, but it feels nice seeing it. But it's early. It's so early. And what I wanted to do today is when you're 2-0, and there's a lot of things happening, and it's very easy to make sweeping statements. So what I wanted to do today is talk about things we're not exactly ready to admit yet. I'll happily go first, unless one of you guys are itching to get out here. I'll, I'll e- even say mine is special teams related-ish. So if we, 
on the spot, want to think of a way, because I think Josh, years is off it. We have all three units of the field figured out. All wow. right. Wow, look at this. Um, we could have almost communicated and figured this out <laughs> together, <laughs> but we we just realized it now. <laughs> if the stars are aligning, Merrick, since you are uh, wearing the, probably the nicest hat out of the three of us, no offense, Josh, how about you? I have that one in my closet. Don't make me run over there and get it. I'll, okay. <laughs> I'm wearing a, yeah, that's a better shirt. So, so we're talking today, we're talking about things that we're not ready to admit about the 2023 Miami Dolphins. Is that correct? So maybe other people, maybe other people on Dolphins Twitter, you know, they're they're they got the group think going and they're, you know, they're they're dead set in their ways regarding these topics, but we're kind of going against the grain a little bit. We're we're saying we're not ready to jump aboard those bandwagons. We we've got a differing point of view. And I feel like mine's going to get me a lot of hate. I feel like hopefully this doesn't get some negative reviews from the podcast at uh, M brave at yeah. M brave 13 on, on X. <laughs> don't please Yo, listeners. Don't blame Jake. Don't break. Don't blame Josh. This is just, this is just my thoughts after week two. And after week two, the thing that I'm not ready to admit, I'm not ready to admit that the Miami dolphins should have caved to Christian Wilkin Wilkins contract demands. Christian Wilkins reportedly, yeah, I can see on that screen, Josh, giving me the thumbs down here. Listen, I love Christian Wilkins. I think he's a great player. I think he he does more for the Dolphins than just what the production he brings on the field. I think he's a locker room leader. I think he's the life, blood, the heart and soul of that defense. Christian Wilkins, rumors are that he wants to be the highest paid defensive tackle in the NFL. He wants to reset the market. So you're looking at a contract that pays Christian Wilkins roughly $25 million a year to do that, where the reports were the Dolphins were more in line with the Dexter Lawrence contract. And I feel like the Dexter Lawrence contract was somewhere around $18 million a year. So th there's quite a big difference between what the Dolphins are willing to pay Christian Wilkins, the offer that they reportedly rumored to have on the table for him, and the amount of money that he wants, $25 million a year is a lot of money. And the Dolphins have a lot of players that they, they need to pay. And all of a sudden, they have one of the top quarterbacks in the NFL, Tua Tungavailoa, who, if he stays healthy, there's those words again, if he stays healthy, will be commanding a contract that pays him probably $50 million a year. You're going to have to cut some corners when that happens. And, and, and defensive tackles... Are good are, are good to have. They're great to have, but at twenty five million dollars a year, that that's that's kind of a tough pill to swallow. So, I took a look at Christian Wilkins' stats through two games, and I I, I went to our favorite web website, Pro Football Focus (PFF). You know, there's some fans of PF, PFF, some haters out there. I wanted to take a look. I wanted to see where he's at this season. Well, Christian Wilkins has an overall defensive grade of sixty seven. That's pretty average, maybe slightly above average. That doesn't scream $25 million a year to me. Now, week one was a bad week. 52.3 overall defensive grade for Christian Wilkins in week one. You know, that whole defense was bad week one. Everybody, we watched that game. They were getting gashed, particularly by the run, uh, you know, right up the gut, right where Christian Wilkins plays. So that whole defense got poor grades week one. Week two, he jumped up to an 81.3. Uh, that's really good. 81.3 is really good. That might be worth $25 million a year. But my point is the Dolphins were right not to give him that money just yet because the Dolphins still control C Christian Wilkins' future for two years. They can give him the franchise tag after this season, and then they can give him the franchise tag again and still pay him less than that $25 million a year that he might be seeking. If Christian Wilkins continues to put up numbers and, and rack up the stats like he did in week two, he did have a sack week two against the Patriots. So, you know, you give him a sack every other game, that gets him to that, that eight sack, nine sack number, eight and a half sacks. That's the, you know, for a defensive tackle, eight and a half sacks is going to get you that big money contract. If he continues to do that, then we might figure out what we can do there. They've already paid Zach Sealer. Zach Sealer, by contrast, on PFF through two games, actually has a 68.3 overall defensive grade, which is 1.3 points higher 
than Christian Wilkins. So if you put stock into PFF grades, which it feels like when they grade the Dolphins well, we're like, yeah, PFF grades them real high. This must be a good site right here. And then when they when they grade them low, we're like, ah, PFF is trash. Nobody looks at that. So I guess it's all going to depend on what side of the fence you sit on regarding this Christian Wilkins situations. If you want him to stay, you want him to be paid, then you're going to look at those week two numbers and say that's who he is. And and, and those numbers are legitimate. But if, if you're on the side, and there's very few people on this side, mind you, that are like, hey, let's not pay Christian Wilkins. Let's let him walk after a year or two and use this money elsewhere. Pay Jalen Waddle, pay Tua Tonga Bailoa, pay Javon Holland, pay Jalen Phillips. They got a lot of guys who need to be paid. If you're on that side, then you look at his week one numbers and go, ooh, oh, that was pretty poor. You know, if he's going to continue doing that, then I don't know if we should pay this guy. I'm not firmly planted on either side of this fence. Where I'm at right now is I am comfortable with the Miami Dolphins waiting and seeing how this season pans out. If Christian Wilkins has a Christian Wilkins type season, and it's good, but not great, then maybe you can go back to that table and see if you can bring that number, that $25 million a year that he's rumored to be asking for. Maybe you can bring that number down a little bit, maybe meet somewhere in the middle, and, and you can keep him on the team. Because I want Christian Wil Wilkins on the Miami Dolphins. I do. But if he has a down year and his sacks aren't up, you know, that's the big talking point. He's got to get more sacks to get more money. If his sacks aren't up, then maybe he's just going to have to settle for that $17, $18 million a year that the Dolphins are currently rumored to be offering. So I think that's where I'm at. I am not jumping on that bandwagon of everybody else on Twitter, hashtag pay the man, you know, at this point through two weeks. I'm not there yet. You could find me there by midseason, by season's end, but I'm not there yet. I want to see how it plays out. And if, uh, you know, if they have to play hardball and they have to franchise tag them this next year, I think I'm okay with that too. So I, I know there's going to be a lot of people who don't like that viewpoint, but that's kind of what we're doing today. That's the spirit of the show. Let's let's go against the grain. Let, you know, let's let's uh, let's throw out some hot takes, baby. And I feel like that one's sizzling. I just want you to at me next time talking about pay the man. I, I hashtag that <laughs> for Connor Williams. I think all the way dating back to Jarvis Landry. It's not um, your money, Josh. Yeah, it's not my money. I mean, if you go back to before last year, I think Jake and I did some podcasts, and I think I admittedly said I would rather re-sign Zach Sealer, and that was before Christian Wilkins went, you know, all Megazoid, right? He loves the Power Rangers. He just nice. put it all together this past year, and he's – I mean, some team's going to pay him $25 million, right? I don't think that – it's really necessary that we're sitting here arguing his value. It's his value to the Dolphins and what they can do. Because like you mentioned there, Merrick, I mean, to a time about if he continues on this, whether you like it or not, whether you thought he was worth X amount of money before the season, if he continues on this trajectory, you're paying him. You have to pay him top of the market money. And then, you know, that salary cap's even a bigger issue than we were already looking at. So I'm glad they locked Zach Steeler up because he's a stud. Interested to see what Raekwon Davis continues to do because he also had a pretty good game, I think, um, this past sure week. Did. But but um, yeah, man, Christian Wilkins, no one wants to see him leave the Miami Dolphins. You just got to figure out a way to make this all work because um, not everyone can get paid, um, you know, top five, top three money. And Chris Greer, I gave him kudos earlier, Reggie McKenzie, Marvin Allen. They got to figure out a way to get this all worked out over these next few years because, you know, we're sitting here praising how awesome this team looks right now. It doesn't take very long for us to, you know, maybe be looking like the Los Angeles Rams and sitting here, you know, with our head down. But if it results in a ring, I don't think any of us care. So it's also important to keep in mind the, the cause and effect here, right? You don't pay Christian Wilkins and you re-sign, you mentioned the Zach Sealer contract and the Alec Engle. They actually happened like right after it came out that the Dolphins and Wilkins weren't working on an extension, which I thought was interesting. I, I really do like the, like, it's so hard to sit there and like stand up and say like, and hold your ground in a situation like this, because it, it can pass you right by a situation, especially, I mean, the Dolphins should have re-signed Christian Wilkins two years ago when you could have got him 16, 17 million dollars. Hindsight's always 2020, but I, I'm really hoping something that can happen out of this is Christian Wilkins plays well, right? He has another strong season and then we can talk about the franchise tag. I wonder if now, and I'm a little worried about it, the franchise tag for some players is completely taboo. They do not want to be offered that franchise tag. So I'm wondering if there's a way where Christian Wilkins plays well enough where he'd be open to the idea of the franchise tag for a year, even if it just kind of helps Miami regain its footing with the uh, Emmanuel Agbas and different contracts like that. So that's going to be my big thing. You know, we, we see Christian Wilkins being so professional entering the season and saying, you know, he's just focusing on the team. How long does he do that before he starts to get frustrated? We will wait and see. But I want to ask you guys, um, after week one, 
what, 250 rushing yards. The Chargers put up 34 points. Mike McDaniel said there were some guys, I don't want to even say freelancing, but they were going for their stats, right? They weren't trusting the system. They weren't necessarily doing their job as much as they were trying to just be disruptive. You look at what Christian Wilkins did from week one to week two. Is it a snap of the fingers where, all right, he's into the system now and this is what we expect moving forward? Or is the truth somewhere in the middle there? Yeah, I think part of the part of the story as to why the numbers look so much better week two versus week one is it could be literally broken down to the fact that the Chargers have a much better offensive line than the New England Patriots do. And that's even considering the New England Patriots had a bunch of injuries uh, on that offensive line. Their starting left tackle was out. Their starting right tackle was out. Their interior players were coming back from injuries, you know, probably not 100% yet. Whereas the Chargers are, are one of the highest graded offensive lines in the NFL. Plus they have a great running back in Austin Eckler. You know, Ramondre Stevenson is a good back for the new England Patriots, but without an offensive line that can, that can move these defenders, then the run game's not going to be as good. Plus it was the second game in the Rick fit, excuse me, the Vic Fangio system. Um, I think there's a lot of different factors at play, which is why after two games, I'm not willing to plant my flag on either side of this. I just need to see more. And that's really what my, my hot take is, is all about is that, you know, while everyone's screaming, Hey, we got to pay Christian Wilkins. I'm more on the we don't have to pay Christian Wilkins, not yet anyways. He's under contract for this season. He's there. He's practicing. He's playing. Let's just see how it goes. There's there's nothing that says we have to pay him now. There's actually no benefit to the Dolphins to pay him now other than, you know, the the angle where, oh, hey, you, you keep him happy and the team gets happy and yada, 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 right? He's a professional. He's going out there. He's doing what he's supposed to do. He's still making $10 million this season. That's pretty good for a guy who was averaging like two and a half million his first few years in the league. So 10 million is pretty good. Go out there, put the type of season that's going to get you that 20 plus million dollars a year, put it on tape. And then we can go back to the, to the table. We can discuss numbers and we can discuss long-term deals. The Dolphins want to keep Christian Wilkins. They don't want him to go anywhere, especially because, He's from uh, uh, Massachusetts, last time I checked. And, uh, you know, the team that plays there is the New England Patriots. And we don't want to see him suiting up in that navy blue every week for that, you know, god-awful franchise. So I think the Dolphins want to keep him. I think Wilkins wants to be in Miami. They're just at an impasse right now over his perceived value to the team. And, and Chris Greer's doing his due diligence as the general manager of the squad. And he knows, hey, I got to ton of players I need to pay. Christian Wilkins is one of them, but I can't burn through, you know, 25 million in cap space every year right now. I got other problems that I'm trying to solve. I need to know if Tua is going to stay healthy. I need to know if Waddle's going to stay healthy. We got issues with him right now too. You know, I need to know if Javon Holland is going to take that next step. If Jalen Phillips is going to take that next step. We got questions with some of these young guys. I think we all think they're going to be great players and we all think they're on the right path. But for right now, there's questions that need to be answered with Christian Wilkins and with everybody else, too. So uh, let's hope that these questions get answered in a way where we all feel good about it. And then they can come to uh, terms on the on the contract numbers here. Yeah, I think the ship sailed on the new contract getting done right before the season. I think that's over and done with. And to your question, Jake, I think it's a little bit of both, you know, just being in a new system for a second game only. I mean, he's still trying to get his feet wet. And Vic Fangio himself said he didn't put his guys in the right position in that week one matchup. So um, it's all coming together. And I think we'll see Christian Wilkins best football, you know, ahead of us. And that's what we need. So he's a he's an absolute workhorse, right? Two things that stick out about Christian Wilkins. I think he's Led the league among defensive tackles and tackles in each of the last two years. He's been flirting around 100. And both him and Zach Sealer are complete Ironmen. I think they both play more than 90% of snaps. I'm just pulling that number out of my out of, out of the pocket. But I do think that, um, that that's kind of their thing, right? They don't leave the field. They're always at the heart of the defense. So this is going to be some really lazy analysis. But to wrap this up, guys, what do the numbers have to look like for you to be comfortable offering Christian Wilkins that big contract? I'll even start, I'll set the tone. I don't think the 90 tackles is necessarily necessary. So I'll even go uh, 80 tackles, 10 sacks, and Christian Wilkins makes $25 million a year. Yeah, at 10 sacks, absolutely. $25 million a year. If you're getting 10 sacks, um, you know, especially in a Vic Fangio defense where supposedly they're not trying to blitz a whole lot, but we saw some good blitzes against uh, the Patriots at the very least. But uh, 
if you can get pressure with your your front four, your front five, whatever it may be, uh, that's that's how you win in a Vic Fangio defense. So if he's getting 10 sacks on that defensive line, then yep, go ahead. Give him that 25 mil. I'll, I'll be the first in line to congratulate him on that contract. Yeah, I was going to say, you could probably even get down to like seven and a half sacks if you're truly trying to um, get down to schematics. But honestly, I think it's more about other people, right? I mean, I've talked, we talked about Tua's contract. I mean, it might be more about how he plays and how much they got to pay him and allocate money here to Connor Williams or, you know, Jalen Phillips is coming up, Javon Holland. I, we don't need to talk about everybody that needs to get paid. But um, again, I think Christian Wilkins will hit that number. I think he's determined to, right? I mean, a lot of guys play their best football in a contract year. He wants to prove to the Dolphins that they do need to pay him $25 million because, you know, a lot of us probably would have been good before the year. $20 million, somewhere in that, we would have been happy. At this point, though, it just seems like his price tag's going up. But who knows? One thing we do know is Chris Greer doesn't like to overpay and always sets his price, right? I mean, you yeah. got to tip your hat to him for that. 90 tackles and three sacks. It's kind of crazy to think that in 15 more games, he'd only get two sacks, but 90 tackles, three sacks. Is that franchise tag worthy? Yeah, I, I think Christian Wilkins, what he's put on tape the last two seasons, and if he can kind of get similar numbers to that this year, that's already franchise tag worthy. I think he's a great defensive tackle, and I don't necessarily feel like defensive tackles need to get those high sack numbers. For some reason, the Dolphins do, or at least it seems like they do. Um, so he's not going to get that that long-term deal if he only has three sacks this year, but the 90 tackles is, is kind of where it's at, especially for a defensive tackle. And if he has 90 tackles, that means this rushing defense turned it around from week one. They stayed good for the rest of the year. And uh, if this rushing defense is good, then we know that pass defense is going to be good uh, in this Fangio system. So it's going to be a, a top 10 unit easily. Josh, what are you biting your tongue about? What don't you want to admit yet? What am I? Okay, so this is me just being a fantasy guy. I was sitting here. I could have went either way here. I originally was going to come on here and talk about how Dan Marino and Don Schuller are the next uh, Mike McDaniel and Tua Tagovailoa, or vice versa. You know what I'm trying to say. But I'm, I'm going to talk. About, yeah, I'm going to talk about the running back room. And you know, we all love what Raheem Mostert did throughout two games: 28 carries, 158 yards, three touchdowns. He actually has as many touchdowns already through two weeks than he had all of last year rushing the football. Um, but, I mean, we all sat here and we got enamored with, you know, uh, DeAndre Swift, Josh Jacobs, Saquon Barkley, Dalvin Cook, some pre-draft guys. I mean, the Dolphins still have interest in bringing in a veteran guy. So I'm sitting here wondering, I'm debating, do they need that premier running back? Do they need to go out there and maybe trade for a Jonathan Taylor, which they were already ready to, you know, give the bank to, right? I mean, they're ready to pay him top dollar, according to some reports. I guess this goes back to the whole Tua thing. I mean, now I'm saying this. I mean, Tua, again, he's going to cut into some of that money there, but – should the Dolphins go out there and make a trade for a vet? And I think they still should, despite how good Raheem Mostert looks. This is no knock against him, but he has missed time. I think he played in two uh, seasons where he played 16 games. In 2017, he uh, was out knocked out of the season with an MCL, a forearm in 2018. He was out last year when we needed him in Buffalo against uh, the Bills in the playoffs. So he has missed some time. Um, draft sharks. I don't know if you guys ever saw his website, but they had like a little uh, diagram of his b human body with all these little injuries on it, but they actually <laughs> project how many games they can miss and like how uh, sustainable to injuries they are throughout a game. Like he was like 84% chance to get hurt. And like he was projected to miss like 3.4 <laughs> games. I'm like, who the hell comes, who comes up with this? But I think at 31 years old, you know, you want to have someone else back there. If you can get a Jonathan Taylor for the right price, you know, you see Cam Akers name coming out there. I don't know what's going on with Jeff Wilson right now. We see Salvin Ahmed banged up. He looks good when he's out there. But Devon A-Chain, I mean, he obviously didn't show them enough to not go out there and flirt with the Jonathan Taylor. So I'm trying to be hot takey here. I think the run game looked awesome. I'm super stoked on what Raheem Mostert did. RB1 for sure, but why not go out there and get Jonathan Taylor? Why not make this thing supersonic like you planned, like you teased for us? Because um, right now we're 2-0, baby. I mean, all these teams have us at the top of the, the totem pole right now. Imagine if you had Jonathan Taylor to that. I mean... I get goosebumps thinking about it, but again, it's not my money. Mike McDaniel wants a first round draft pick, this, that, and the other thing, but there's my hot take. What do you guys think? Merrick, consider what he just said and add on to the fact that this weekend Miami's projected running backs are Raheem Mostert, Devon Eight Chain, and then Chris Brooks. So so have that in mind when, when you get your answer because I think that's sure. a big role in this. Well, as someone who started Raheem Mostert in fantasy last week Man. and plans on starting Raheem Mostert in fantasy this week. That sounds all right to me, baby. But uh, when evaluating the roster, I ask myself this. Again, we've talked ad nauseum on this episode and in past episodes. 
you don't have a lot of money. The, the, the cap space has been eaten up and you still have guys to pay. Adding a, a high price running back to that mix just seems so just not feasible right now. It just, it feels like you're, you got to give up the draft picks and then you got to give up the contract too. And if you would have asked me preseason and, and I think you did, and I was on this show saying, yes, let's make this trade for Jonathan Taylor. I would have been all in for it, but seeing the way this offensive line has improved and seeing the well, the way that Raheem Mostert has run the ball through two games. Again, it's early. Like you said, Josh, he's a little bit injury prone and he's up there in age 31 years old. Um, you know, seeing the way the offensive line has improved, I feel like you don't need that superstar back right now because you're in a system that traditionally hasn't needed a, a superstar back. Now we did see San Francisco go out there and trade for Christian McCaffrey, and he is lighting it up in San Francisco, as all of us fantasy football players know. Tried to trade for him this week. Uh, that swiftly got declined. Um, but I just I just feel like there's other areas of this team you got to spend your money on, and I don't know if running back – uh, is one of those areas. They just drafted Devon A. Chain. Let's see what he can do. Chris Brooks looked really good in the preseason. Let's see, maybe he he gets on the field against the Broncos and, and maybe can do a little something. We haven't seen Jeff Wilson yet. He's going to come back in a few weeks. Maybe he adds a little bit, uh, you know, more life, more juice to this running back room when he, when he gets out here. So for me, I think at this point, especially seeing what they did against the Patriots, who have a good defense, uh, I think I'm out on the Jonathan Taylor trade. And I think I'm rolling with, uh, with the guys that the dolphins have. And if for some reason that doesn't work out, what round was Jonathan Taylor drafted in? Oh, he was drafted right after knowing, but I already know exactly where you're going with this. He, he, was dra- he was a second round draft pick. So you don't have to invest high into these running backs to, to see, you know, the, these big returns from them. So why can't the dolphins just invest a second round pick in a running back next year? One of the top, running backs that that comes out it's totally doable it's totally possible and if you're on you know the if you're on the train that that running backs can be taken in the first round i'm not necessarily on that train then they could spend a first round pick on a running back if they feel like that's that's the final piece but when you draft a running back you don't got to pay big money to a running back and that's what the dolphins need right now they need contributors and and stars that are are drafted by the team that are homegrown and that are on cheap contracts because they can't afford any more expensive contracts with all the people that they got to pay. So for right now, I like Jonathan Taylor as the player. And a couple of weeks ago, I was all in on it. But for right now, I think I'm out on the Jonathan Taylor trade. So Raheem Mostert, he ranks seventh right now in yards, 158 on the year. And his 5.6 yards per carry, I think is sixth among starting running backs. Someone please fact check me on that, but he's definitely flirting up there with that average as well. Now, Josh, I love what you're saying about just go full blown supersonic. If you're going to max out any player that isn't a kicker or a punter, running back's the easiest one to add to your team, right? Just because while you're maxing him out, you're paying him a big contract. It's still cheaper than Christian Wilkins. Hell, it might even be like half of what Christian Wilkins was asking. If you can wrap your head around that. However, I I don't know if it's like the Jonathan Taylor before the season. I think it can make sense on how you're putting things together in season. If you're trying to build the plane as it's flying is a little different, especially when you want to bring in someone like Jonathan Taylor, who would be your lead back. What I want to ask you guys, because thinking of a a depth chart of Raheem Mostert, Devon A. Chain and Chris Brooks is, is absolutely terrifying to me. Um, I think early on Devon A. Chain is going to be someone like Selvan Ahmed. We're seeing this year. Last year, Selvan Ahmed had one target. All regular season. Through two games, he has 10. That screams to me what they're going to try to do with Devon H. And that tells me exactly like, hey, we're going to get him involved in the passing attack. Salvan Ahmed gets like three carries a game. That's great. He can be a utility player. He can make an impact. I don't know if I can trust him if Raheem Mostert gets down. What about this? What if we don't go full Jonathan Taylor? I'm going to throw two names out here. One's going to be much more expensive than the other, but we'll start with the one that's probably a little too far out there. What's stopping them from maybe sending like a fourth round pick for like a James Conner? Just somebody who can come in, be established, be healthy, um, be consistent. My fear is you just sign another Chase Edmonds, someone who just cannot operate in the wide zone scheme. But that's one scenario I look at. And then maybe even a Cleo Herbert who's losing trust in with the Bears. That would be a late round pick. That's someone who can catch the ball in the backfield as well. These are scenarios I kind of look at as like the the duct tape, the glue, the bubble gum, whatever you want to do to put this roster together midseason, where I think over the last couple of years, we've really liked what Chris Greer has done maybe early in the season, late in training camp in terms of just 
adding those final pieces, it hasn't always worked with like the Trey, uh, Trey Flowers, Mackenzie Alexander's getting hurt. But those are some players, if you really wanted to get talking to me, I'd start to listen because uh, when I had Dustin on yesterday, please go check that pot if you haven't. He even brought up the fact for he, or, um, Jeff Wilson, he's coming back, but that's another player who has had injury issues throughout his career too. So I see an issue trying to bring in someone like Jonathan Taylor, another big contract, but I think you can have an ecosystem where you keep Wilson's the most starts and you throw in like a Herbert or something like that. I, I think I could see things kind of uh, start to make a little sense. Yeah, I think I want to see more from Devon A. Chain before we, you know, go cherry picking off other people's teams. You know, his shoulder injury that he suffered in the preseason has kind of hampered him so far, and it's it's maybe delayed his his start to this season. I think once he gets things going, he had a, a, a I think his first carry was for five yards, and it got called back due due to a a penalty on on someone. But uh, I think I think he's electric. I think he can add more speed to this offense if that's even possible. So I think I'd like to see what he can do before we decide to bring in some more names, some more bodies. And you know what? If it doesn't work out, you may not even have to send a draft pick to somebody for one of their running backs because there's still a guy like Leonard Fournette who's available in free agency. And, and he is a, a capable NFL back who has had uh, varying degrees of success. But but at, at some point in his career, he was, he was a, a big name you know in the nfl and he's out there right now let me just reiterate we're nitpicking here because i think we all liked what we saw to this offensive line what we saw to this running back room um i guess i'm looking at this maybe from the dolphins standpoint you know you came into this year knowing what raheem moster could do when healthy which is what we're seeing you know what jeff wilson could do when he's healthy which i mean i don't know that's kind of what trading for a late round you know a fifth round or sixth rounder for one of these other guys kind of feels like another jeff wilson move so um i guess my biggest thing is the dolphins already for some if the reports are true, which I guess this is what I'm basing this all off of, they were ready to pay him that contract that he wanted. They were. So they were. if that if that is true, I mean, he was already in their plans. I mean, how how they fit that in with all the guys they got to pay, I mean, none of us could even guess. But when you already have that, you have compensation, you know, you're right around there. They're not getting Jalen Waddle. I mean, if you can move a pick to bring a Jonathan Taylor in, I think you do it. But, um, again, I think we all are pretty comfortable with what they have at the running back room. But at some point, I mean, the Dolphins have proven that they're not, right? I mean, even with when everyone was healthy, they were still flirting with all these guys. So I say shoot for the moon, 2-0. I mean, no one's going to stop you if you had Jonathan Taylor to this, um, you know, this Madden ultimate team. But um, we're feeling good, especially with all these guys, the way they're playing now. Let's just hope they can stay healthy. So, Josh, what's what's the most you'd be willing to give up? What's the most you'd be willing to send to Indianapolis for Jonathan Taylor? Would you He's go as first. high as a first-round pick? first round pick? I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I would. I mean, are you that confident you're going to finish? Like, uh, you know, if you trade for John Taylor, you better be finishing like 28. You better be finished top four, right? Somewhere in there. I, I was going to say a second. I mean, if you can make that, if they want it to be a conditional where you know he rushes for a thousand yards or I don't know, plays X amount of snaps and it goes to a first. I, I don't know that I'd hate that, but um, I'd, I'd like to see a Dolphins draft on round one, right? I, I, I miss those days when we sat there and had yes. something to look forward to. But then again, I don't miss, uh, you know, we got Tyree Kill. Just and, winning football yeah, games. We got Tyree Kill, we got games. Bradley Chubb, you know. So I guess I don't uh, miss those. So sure, man. Uh, no, I can't say trade a first. A conditional second, I would consider. Josh, the point's like clear that they're making. The, the Dolphins really got to uh, poop or get off the pie. If you're, just, if you're just sitting there in the stall all day, I mean, you're, you're helping nobody. You're just hurting everyone. And the key, uh, somebody please jump on this if I'm wrong, but I think it was Chris Greer who even said, like, you don't want to make trades or you don't want to sign players when you have to. You want to sign them when you can type of thing. So I, I just am a little scared, and, and this is why I think Josh has a great conversation of, all you need is one guy to fall out of the rotation, and all of a sudden this running back room looks a little different, and you're – you're praying, Miles Gaskin, please, please come back. But until then, I love what Raheem Mostert is doing. I do like the idea of Jeff Wilson coming back. He knows the system. But what if this team is the Miami Dolphins? That's always the fear if everything can just crumble around us. That's a good way to make things negative, isn't it? Don't we all feel <laughs> frightened scary about doing all? This is a controversial episode we're putting out there. Yeah, and, and we're, we're undefeated, and we're so happy and sitting on cloud nine, and we're trying to nitpick for the first time. Like, we always just <laughs> always so happy and cheerful, and now we're like, go get a trade for a running back. Mostert's three, tu- Mostert's three touchdowns aren't enough. He's, that's tied for first in the league, by the way. Yeah, I know. Oh, is it tied, or is he, is he alone? He's tied. No, I think there's two others with him, but I – Oh, yep, yep. Uh, Anthony Richardson, Richardson was, Yeah, Kyrie. I was going to say, I thought Richardson was one of them. Kyron Williams too. Wow, look at look at that. Look yeah, at I should that. have picked him up in more leagues. I, I balked in some of them. 
the Rams for fantasy have been so scared because you never want to go all in on a guy after the one week, right? You never want to just, hey, Puka Nakua, sick. He had one great game, and all of a sudden he had another 30 points for me. But that's it. I digress about that in the in the fantasy talk. But, guys, like, we're, we're nit, but, like, we're not flipping tables, right? These are legitimate, like, questions about the Miami Dolphins and the state of the Miami Dolphins. And when you have a team that's 2-0, and it's not just – Tua and Tyreek, right? It's not just the defensive line. It's like there's so many pieces going on here where I think it is important to kind of reevaluate these things where we can like be sitting here in August next year and throw a big well actually at people that we are going to discuss this stuff two weeks into the season. That being said, guys, seeing Mike McDaniel on the sideline, there's always a level of confidence, right? You know, third and 20, he's going to do a keg stand, make a great play to uh, keep the ball moving and things like that. 90% of the time when I see a camera go on Mike McDaniel, I'm feeling pretty good about what's about to happen, that he has it under control. There are two scenarios where I don't think we're talking enough about where Mike McDaniel, what on earth are you doing? One, I'll get the quick one out of the way. What the hell was that challenge flag? What was the idea behind challenging that play? Because I think it was the quickest Nah, Mike McDaniel, you're wrong. And and then the play was just over. What what were you guys thinking? Because me and my dad were looking at each other like, what is there to challenge here? And I, and I don't think this is the first time we've seen this from McDaniel either, where the challenges have been a little uh, little wacky to say the least. Yeah, not not the best, not the best at the challenges. Has he won one? Did he go over last year? Oh, I think he might still be winless in challenges. I think, I think he's won one. He has. Did he? he did he get one. one last week? Maybe. Like I, f- I felt like maybe that was a thing where they're like, "Holy crap, he finally got one." <laughs> it's whatever it is. If he has one, he has two. It's a low percentage. He doesn't. He doesn't get a lot of them. And he has said multiple times. And I wonder if it's even true. If he's just trying to de- deflect some of the heat off of himself, that he has a guy that like tells him, "Hey, no, this is the one to challenge." Like. Fire that guy. That guy doesn't deserve his job anymore because he's really bad at that. So, so Mike, if if you got to do, if you got to drop the hammer here, we got to get this guy out of here. Because yeah, I agree with you, Jake. Those those challenges are questionable at best. I have a theory that he's trying just to test out different game scenarios. You know, like okay, I want to try this without only this many timeouts, and I'm going to waste one right here, <laughs> something like that. Oh, so he, so what he's doing, he's duct taping the 40s to his hands, is what you're telling me. There were 40 hands, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the, that's one of them, and, and I think we feel the same way when we see this. So the Dolphins are on the 43-yard line. It's fourth and three. Dolphins have one of the best offenses in the NFL. They have a chance to ice the game with the first down. And instead of relying on all these explosive weapons on offense, here comes Jason Sanders trying out to miss oh, a 55-yard field goal. And it's not only missing the 55-yard field goal because last year Sanders was 4 of 6, which is, hey, we'll take that from plus 50. It was the fact that earlier in the game, Bill Belichick just pulled a book, Bill Belichick, and his name was Brendan Schooler, who came sprinting from the sideline to block a Jason Sanders kick earlier in the game. That told me right there, I wouldn't let him kick that 55-yarder. Knowing that he missed the extra point to seal the game the week before, I wouldn't let him kick that 55 yard here. Knowing that he is sixth in attempts with, or excuse me, fifth in attempts with six, but is 66% field goal percentage is 29th, I wouldn't let him make that kick. So, guys, where is this praise or this confidence in Jason Sanders coming from? Because I hear. Uh, I think it's the uh, Ringer podcast. They have a former GM on it. He was uh, with the Dolphins for a little while. He does a show with Mike Sando. I can't think of his name. Uh, Mueller, maybe? Might be his last name. But either way, he was talking about how with a kicker, you don't even need the best kicker in the world. What you need is somebody who, when he leaves the hotel first thing in the morning, he doesn't look up and already wonder what the wind is doing. You just need someone who can go out there and be confident. I think they even brought up uh, A.J. Feely back in the day about how he wasn't the best kicker, but what he was... He was as confident as they come. And that stuff is so important when you need a kicker where Jason Sanders, I think he can make all the kicks. That confidence, man. This is someone who was a first team all pro a few years ago. We have confidence in him. The Dolphins have confidence in him. Like he's still that player. And I don't think that's a good idea. No. And and you're right. After that, that blocked kick, which was not Jason Sanders fault. That was not his fault. Um, Honestly, I don't think that was that wasn't anybody's fault. Like, that was that, that was, play. That, that, was that was just a great play. Sometimes you just got to tip your hat to to the the other side and say, "Hey, y'all did it." Uh, I don't think 
anyone's going to fall for it again. Like, like that's kind of a one and done scenario. And they broke it out in week two. So congratulations on that one. Patriots. We're going to have to but, play that back the next time they play when they do it again to Jason Sanders. And just I hope that doesn't happen. they're never going to do that again. We'll we'll see about that. But, but you're right. What that did was that killed his confidence and you need a kicker who has nerves of steel. And Jason Sanders has whatever the opposite of that is like nerves of marshmallows or something like that. Like he, if he misses something earlier in the game and he missed the extra point in week one, so that probably already started chipping away at his confidence like like you just see it in his eyes he's just so scared and nervous all the time and i feel like he's just like man i can't wait till my contract run runs out so i can go retire and just you know play golf every day or something like that but yeah mike mcdaniel's decision making and sometimes it's like short yardage play calling and this kind of you know ties into that it really does leave you wanting a little bit you're like what, what are you doing here mike like what do we do and even I feel like in that very specific scenario, you're you're up by seven points late in the game, and you either need to ice it with that with that field goal or get the first down and run out the clock, or at the very least punt the ball away and give the Patriots a long field because they're not world beaters on offense. I think the better decision would have been to just punt the ball away. You know, if you're not gonna go for it on fourth and three with with your all-star offense, you might as well just kick the ball away and and pin the Patriots back, you know, in their own end zone and, and make them drive the length of the field to get the game tying touchdown. But I think kicking of those three scenarios, kicking the field goal, the 55 yard field goal was last on the list by a wide margin. Also, Marshall. I know Jay Feely was only with the team for a year. And I said, AJ Feely. So I just want to throw out there. Go ahead, Josh. Sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say marshmallow finger sounds delicious, but um, I, I I know I don't know how you guys feel, but when you watch a college football game, I mean those kickers are horrendous, and I feel like that's kind of what we see here when Jason Sanders goes out there. You just don't know if it's gonna go in or not. I do think they probably still have confidence in him from last year, right? I mean he made some clutch field goals down the wire where we were sitting there. At least I was making the money sign with uh, spelling out his name, but dude, um. I don't understand what he was doing in that situation. Normally Mike McDaniel uses those, you know, his big kahuna. He goes for it on those, you know, critical situations, game on the line, relying on Jason Sanders from 55 yards out. That's not the call. And then that challenge again, I don't know what he was thinking. So Jason Sanders got to put it together. He's going to be, um, you know, unemployed working at Wendy's putting together junior bacon cheeseburgers or something. <laughs> Dude, I really feel buying Wendy's. No doubt. He's the ninth highest paid kicker in the league. And that's kind of what also <laughs> makes it frustrating. I feel like that that fumbled snap right before that really spooked McDaniel. And he was like, well, shit, if we can't even snap the ball correctly, we might as well just kick this thing and see what happens. So, you know, maybe some of that falls on Connor Williams' shoulders and hopefully he can get those snap snaps, those snap issues corrected because his pass blocking and his run blocking has been great, but you have no issues there. But you almost wonder if maybe the Dolphins make a move for an actual starting center and then just move Connor Williams to guard and say, hey, listen, you don't got to snap anymore. Just block like you've been blocking and we'll let somebody who's actually good at the snapping take over there. So I'd probably trade for a center before I traded for a running back. Isaiah went at right tackle in that scenario? I think Isaiah Wynn would probably go to the bench for me. I don't want to see Isaiah Wynn at right tackle, not because I love Austin Jackson, but uh, I just don't think Isaiah Wynn's very good at right tackle. I think I'm moving Kendall Lamb to right tackle in that scenario because Teron Armstead should be back, practiced with, with no limitations today, they say. Right. Yeah, sure. We'll see how long <laughs> that lasts. <laughs> I tried to say it with a straight face. I did. But yeah, you know, going over that injury news, Teron Armstead practice, Jalen Phillips practice, Jalen Waddle did not practice, but he was in uniform, sand helmet, watching on from the sidelines, stretching, smiling, whatever the hell that means. Concu but I feel like the Dolphins are so nervous about the concussion stuff because of all the Tua stuff last year. They feel like they got a microscope on them at all times. I, I, I'm i starting to feel pessimistic about Jalen Waddle's chances to play this Sunday, and I don't like that. Before I forget, something I do want to say is, uh, Merrick, you mentioned how you were seeing Josh's uh, hand motions earlier. If you want to listen to these shows, our Monday, Wednesday, Friday recordings, so the shows that come out Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, are all available on YouTube. You can find those at Miami 560 WQAM. Josh and I do a great job of point, uh, tweeting out those links. That's mostly a Josh thing, though. So make sure you're following him on Twitter at Houts, at Embrave13, and I'm JMetal94. Merrick? We can't let you go without getting some insight into this week against the Denver Broncos. So we'll start with the simple question. Reno? 
I think so. I think so. I think the Dolphins are a much better team than than the Denver Broncos. This game's at home. Um, I think the Dolphins are eight and one in their last nine games against the Broncos. With what was the only the, one? the only loss was was the Tim Tebow day when Tim Tebow was quarterbacking the Broncos, and the Dolphins honored the University of Florida on the day that the greatest quarterback in University of Florida history was playing against. The Miami Dolphins. Thank you, Stephen Ross, for that one. But yeah, eight and one in the last nine against the Broncos. It's a revenge game for Vic Fangio. It's a revenge game for Bradley Chubb. It's a revenge game for Butch Berry. And I think I even saw you tweet this out earlier today. It's a revenge game for River Craycraft, baby. So uh, a lot of revenge games for for uh, members of the Miami Dolphins this week. And I just think they're too good. I, I'll feel a little bit better about that prediction. If we know that Jalen Waddle's playing, but even without Jalen Waddle, Tyreek is still a monster. Raheem Mostert has been killing it. Craycraft, Barrios, those guys have all been doing really well. Maybe you see a little Robbie Chosen this week, Joshua. I know you'd be you'd be excited for that. Um, that's if Waddle sits, but I, I do think the Dolphins win on Sunday at home, and I do think they go to three and zero, setting up a nice showdown with the the Buffalo Bills Week Four. Let's ride. What did you get? Uh, did you get predictions from the young oh, ones too? Uh, uh, th- they didn't give me their scores. I just realized I didn't give a score prediction either. I think I'm going to go 31. I think I'll go 31 16 Dolphins this week. So uh, a healthy 14 point victory. The Dolphins or my my sons. They didn't want to give me a score prediction. They were just being stubborn for no reason whatsoever. But they they both said, even my pessimistic son, they both said Dolphins win and by a lot. Ooh. By yeah. a lot covering the spread. Yeah, we'll say we'll say we'll put them with you, like more than 13 points, like a two two score game. Uh, Josh, who do, who needs to be on the field this Sunday for the Dolphins have a better shot at winning? Jalen Phillips or Jalen Waddle? I'm gonna say Waddle after what I saw from Andrew Van Ginkle last week. I mean, what a stud. I, I, I didn't want to sit here and put down my boy Jalen Phillips because he's in the Hall of Fame, the Ring of Honor, all that great <laughs> stuff. But um, I feel like Jalen Waddle is just a different monster as a receiver, and I again liked what we saw to Andrew Van Ginkle. Still think there's different things they could do there defensively. So I'll say um, we're better off with Jalen Watt on the field, but I'd like to see them both out there, to be honest. What about you, Mayor? Oh, yeah, and I'm totally not trying to pit that. This is just like uh, me being a complete jerk. What do you think, Mayor? Yeah, I, I agree with Josh. I'd rather see – if I have to pick between the two, I'd rather see Waddle out there because I do – I've always been a big fan of Andrew Van Kinkle. I've always felt like he's an underrated player, and I really think he he showed how valuable he is to this team, and I'm so happy he re-signed with the Dolphins and told the Patriots to kick rocks this offseason. So I think if we need to let Jalen Phillips heal up for another game, I think we're more – uh, more equipped to handle that than the loss of somebody like Jalen Waddle. And it's just the concussion stuff. It's so tricky, the protocol, and there's you got to return by a certain time or else there's no chance for you. I think we'll know more by tomorrow. I think if he doesn't practice tomorrow, that you can pretty much guarantee that he won't be playing on Sunday. Um, but but we'll see. So hopefully, you know, I agree with Josh on two fronts. Hopefully we uh, actually see both of them suit up this weekend. And something that's worth mentioning, too, is even when Jalen Phillips was on the field week one, we, we understand that the Dolphins' defense wasn't great, but Ben Ginkle actually had, like, he was good in coverage. He was dropping back into coverage against the Gerald Everett's a solid receiving tight end, the Austin Ecklers. Obviously, they, the Chargers' offense had a good day, but, I mean, he wasn't the weak link when they're trying to get all these extra guys out here, and that's important, too. Uh, yeah, I agree, Waddle, just because Pat Sertain the second. I'm not saying that um, he'll completely shut down Tyree Kill, but I do think just having them both on the field just adds such a different level to this offense where um, good luck slowing that one down. <laughs> well... Uh, I think we did it. I think we got through it again. Controversial episode for some, but just remember guys, this was supposed to be a little hot takey and these aren't things that we're, we're saying are etched in stone. They're just through two weeks. We're, just, we're coming, we're kind of ruminating these ideas. You know, we're, we're just tossing them around a little bit. We're, we're, we're seeing, we're, we're seeing, you know, how everybody feels on all of this and, and hopefully everything uh, turns out for our dolphins uh, turns out well for our dolphins this season cuz it, it feels it feels like a good year it feels like a special year feels like a fun year and uh you know fingers crossed it it continues heading in that direction Jake do we have to do we have to give a prediction do we have to give throw out numbers or do we do that another time We'll do we'll do that we'll do that Friday just just to give us a little more time to prepare we'll put Merrick on the spot we'll have him do it Monday next week just so he has a complete disadvantage of the entire <laughs> <program>. I emojis <laughs>
that is it, gentlemen. Thank you both so much for joining me. And Merrick, I'm just going to repeat you one last time. The season does feel different. And I want everyone to take this episode as the friend who you knew just had three beers and said, guys, I got an idea in the group chat. Because that <laughs> was. Thank you all so much for listening to another Dolphins podcast. We will be back tomorrow with a new show. But until then, fins up. Fins up, baby. Fins up. Fins up. Fins up.